Hello everybody and welcome to my March 2022 reading wrap up. It's currently the 10th of March and I have about 10 books to go through with you guys. I've kind of fallen behind a little bit with my wrap ups. So we're just going to crack on and get started. Dane reads. All right, so first up uh, we have, this is in no particular order by the way, this is just when I pick, pick up the books from my pile, not the order I read them in, because I can't remember that, sorry. So first up we have uh, Eccentric Circles Short Stories Volume 1 by, uh, well it's by In Circle Publications, edited by Cynthia Brackett Vincent. This is a short story collection with stories from Sue Baumgarder, Mike Beffler, Richard J. Cass, Dane Cobain, I know that guy, he's me. Matt Cost, Sharon L. Dean, Catherine Diltz, Bruno Gomez, Vaughan C. Hardacker, Joe Kilgore, J.K. Now, Scott Lipanovich, B.J. Magnani, S. Lee Manning, Alison L. McLennan, Anne Britting Ollison, Sarah Lynn Richard, J. Rudd, Lois Schmidt, C.B. Shanahan, Kevin St. Jar, A.J. Tibble, and Laura Tupper. Mostly, well, it's got a range of different genres in it, but the majority of them, I would say, are murder mystery slash crime, because that's one of the specialisms that Eccentric Circles has. But there's also little bits of historical fiction in there, some that sort of defy genre as well. Um, overall, I thought it was a really good collection of stories. Obviously, I'm just reviewing this without considering my own story. In fact, I didn't even reread it because I was scared I'd see a typo or something. I generally don't reread my books once they reach print, because it's like I've read them so many times by that point anyway. But yeah, really good stuff in this, some cracking stories. Uh, I mean, let's have a look. What were some of my favorites? See if I can remember from the titles. Uh, the Bank Robber was good. Nuns Fret Not, I enjoyed that. Old Friends and Zip Drives, pretty good. Waiting for the 1215 was fantastic. Uh, the Cat's Clue was quite good. That was a murder mystery where a cat plays a part in the solution. Overall, four out of five would recommend. Strong four out of five as well. Right, what else have we got in this pile? Okay, here we have I've Missed Some Monsters by Fly on the Wall Poetry Press. This is another short story collection, actually. These are all themed around motherhood, so it would be a great little uh, buy for Mother's Day, although I imagine by the time you're watching this, it's already too late for that. So maybe for your mum's birthday or something. Uh, let's see, there are a lot fewer stories in this one. So we have story, well, I can give you, can I give you the names? We've got an index, here we go. We've got May We Know Them by Gaynor Jones, How to Dress a Rabbit by Clayton Lister, which wasn't very vegan. Memory Chip by Helen Nathaniel Fulton. The Last of the Nest Gatherers by Sasha Akhtar, which also wasn't very vegan, but was very interesting. And Pass Through the Waters by Kenzie Millar. Overall, another great collection of short stories. Uh, Fly on the Wall Poetry Press kill it with their short story collections. So I would recommend checking out any of them that you can when you get the chance. This one is another strong four out of five. All right, then we have The Vegetarian by Han Kang. This was the Man Booker International Prize 2016 winner. Um, basically, one of the characters in this becomes a vegetarian and it kind of follows other people's reactions. Her husband is a right dickhead, so is her dad. And we get this like quite a lot of it, or at least the initial part is written from her husband's point of view. And he's the most unlikable character ever. Um, in fact, the only likable character is the titular vegetarian. Um, it's also got quite a weird writing style, so I don't know if this is because that's just how it was originally written in uh, the you know South Korean, or whether it's the translation by Deborah Smith, but quite often it felt like overly simplified and basic. Um, not that that's necessarily too much of a problem. Overall, I, I feel like this book had a message to it, and I can't decide what it was. Um, it was definitely interesting to read as a vegetarian slash a vegan, but also it does just feel as though it's just a load of bad people shitting on this woman, like trying to force feed her meat and stuff, which, you know, that used to happen to me, but when I was at high school, so I wasn't aware that adults did that. There are some horrible people in the world. Um, and one of the guys as well is talking about the, you know, purported benefits of veganism, and he doesn't mention animal rights and animal welfare, which is like the main reason. So it's like, oh yeah, well maybe it's to get rid of the bad spirits in the body. It's like, no mate, it's just because it's not good to kill animals for no reason. Especially in factory farm systems where they suffer a lot before they get killed as well. Anyway, I gave it like a, I'll give it a strong three out of five. It's either that or a weak 3.5 out of five. Don't know if I'd necessarily recommend it. To me, it read like um, an, indie, an indie author's first novel. So I don't really know why it won the Man Booker International Prize, but I, I think prizes are a load of bullshit anyway. All right, up next we've got Stephen Fry's Incomplete and Utter History of Classical Music by Stephen Fry. Uh, I read this as a bedtime book. I've got to be honest, I didn't particularly enjoy it, but then 
That kind of doesn't surprise. I haven't had the best of luck with Stephen Fry's non-fiction. I actually really hated The Ode Less Travelled, which was his book on poetry. This one was a little bit better, but it was just very dense, and it, he tried to put too many jokes in it. It could have been 100 pages shorter if he just took out the jokes and kept the information in. And the jokes didn't engage me. They had the opposite effect of repeatedly taking me out of what I was reading. And also he put like little smiley faces next to his jokes so that you knew they were jokes. But then that just left me thinking, well, they can't be very good jokes if you have to clarify that that's what they are, you know? So yeah, I gave this one uh, a two out of five and wouldn't recommend unless you really want to read more about classical music. And even then there are probably better books on it. Then we've got Strange Meeting by Susan Hill. So Susan Hill uh, is mostly known for writing ghost stories. This is a little different because it's a World War One story. And it's kind of a tale of love between these two soldiers. Um, she actually says in an essay at the end, in her mind it was um, platonic love, um, but you could read it as you know sexual love as well, it's kind of totally up to you in that respect. And what's cool about this is that while the war is the backdrop of the story, um, it's not necessarily a story about the war, it's very much about these two characters. Uh, very well written, did enjoy, it's a strong 3.5 out of 5 for me. Okay, then we have the books that are still on my review pile. So we have Deep Down There by Ollie Jacobs. Ollie is an indie writer. This is a story, it's set in a, a gated community called Anton Court, and it's basically this giant hole opens up and the residents of the court kind of have to learn to deal with it. And we see what happens there. There's, again, a lot of character work in here, but also some really cool plot and a lot of suspense because we don't know what caused the hole or what's at the bottom of it. He was going to try and get this published by Unbound originally, but that never happened, so he self-published. I'm just glad that I've finally got my hands on it because I've been looking forward to getting to this for a while. And it was a four out of five for me. Good indie novel. Then we got a bunch of Michael Crichton, so we've got The Andromeda Strain. Um, this is, I think, his first novel, or one of his first novels, and this is about, basically, a satellite comes down from space and it brings with it this sort of new type of bacteria that kind of unleashes a plague on humanity, and we uh, follow these sort of lab researchers as they try to, um, you know, to stop it from killing everybody, basically. Uh, probably 3.5 out of 5 for me, it was okay. It wasn't as good as I was expecting, bearing in mind this is probably his second most well-known book after Jurassic Park, but it was okay. I also um, watched the two movie versions of it as well, and again, they were they were just okay. The new one was quite cool because it had the guy who plays Captain Holt in Brooklyn Nine-Nine in it. Then we have Airframe by Michael Crichton. Didn't really tab too much out of this, although I will be doing a review. Um, and this is basically, it's kind of, it was it was a good timing for me because I just watched this documentary about Boeing. I think it might have been called Downfall. It was on Netflix anyway. And it was about how Boeing had gone from being like a super safe airplane manufacturer to basically worrying too much about shareholders and cutting corners and then the loss of life that entails, you know? And this is a very similar thing. There's an accident on a plane and we kind of watch the investigating team as they try to figure out what happened. Again, it was an okay 3.5 out of 5. And then I read Prey by Michael Crichton. So this is more more of a recent one. Um, it's about like nanotechnology and it's kind of, again, these like little nano robots escape from the lab and they pose like a severe threat to humanity and we follow this group of people as they try and sort of try and tackle it I suppose. The first 50 to 100 pages of it were much more of like almost a domestic story about this unemployed guy and his wife um, and then he ends up basically being tasked with discovering what's going on with these nano robots and trying to stop them. Um, I actually weirdly preferred that first 100 pages a lot more. I thought it started to lose steam towards the second half but it was still okay and it was a 3.5 out of 5. And that brings me up to date. Greetings everybody, I have two books to wrap up for you today that I've finished off reading. The first is The Tin Woodman of Oz by L. Frank Baum. Um, this one was interesting because obviously The Tin Woodman is the main character, I say obviously. This is probably the first of the Oz books that hasn't been a misnomer and where it's called something like The Tin Woodman of Oz and The Tin Woodman is actually a major character in it. Um, but yeah, a lot of fun. We get to see a lot of the old uh, favourite characters, a few cool new ones as well. And it's got a romance story at the heart of it. But it's um, romance that I like because it's like not just horrible cringy stuff. Basically The Tin Woodman is like, oh yeah, I used to love this girl before I got turned into tin, but now I have no heart. And then basically he realises that in order to be a good person he should probably go and see if she still wants to marry him. Um, and she ends up marrying essentially Frankenstein's monster. Um, so yeah, that was a, probably a strong 3.5 out of 5. 
And then I read Bosch How to Live Vegan by Henry Firth and Ian Theesby. So the Bosch guys have a YouTube channel, which I would recommend checking out. They do a lot of great vegan and plant-based uh, recipes that are worth looking at. And yeah, this is basically a definitive guide to going vegan that covers everything you need to know from where do you get your protein to what products to look out for and like sneaky additions to various products that, you know, people put in like, I don't know, actual milk powder into crisps and all of this stuff. So yeah, this was probably a four out of five for me. It's really nicely laid out, um, very readable. I mean, I think it took me two days to read, less than that maybe, um, despite it being relatively thick. And it's just a great little book if you're interested in learning more about veganism. So I would recommend, uh, yeah. Did I give it a rating? We'll give it a four out of five, it was good. Hello everybody, just the one book to update for you today and that is John Steinbeck, East of Eden. My edition is actually falling apart, but it doesn't matter too much because I got the audiobook of this anyway uh, and listened to that while doing my jogs. It's a long old slug, it took quite a while to get through it because the audiobook alone was like 26 hours. But it was very beautifully written, um, some really interesting ideas in here. There was even a character called Dane towards the end, who I believe, I think he went to fight in the war, I can't remember. Um, there's a lot to remember from this, you know, a lot of whorehouses and all of that kind of stuff as well. It's just one of those sort of great American novels, so I gave it a 4 out of 5, but I'm definitely glad I read it by audiobook, because I don't think it would I would have been able to stick with it otherwise, you know. Hello everybody, just got the one book to wrap up for you today, just going to get myself comfy, don't mind me. And that is The Thursday Murder Club by Richard Osman. I think this was the best selling book of last year, it's certainly, you know, it's the record breaking number one bestseller. Pick this up from Cancer Research UK for £2.50. In fact, let me see if I can get that sticker off. Um, mostly picked it up just because it's been super popular, so I wanted to see what the big deal was. It was pretty good. It's a pretty good like crime novel with bits of humour in. It took me a little while to get used to Osmond's writing style. I didn't, you know, love it to begin with, but um, I soon sort of found myself being absorbed by the story, so that's always good. Um, and yeah, it was very competently done. I think it's maybe overhyped because there are a lot of other similar books on the market that do a very similar thing. But yeah, it was pretty good. Uh, I gave it a four out of five. All right, guys, just the one book to wrap up for you today, and that is Asterix et le Chaudron by Argosini and Eodet. So this is a Bande dessinée, which is a French graphic novel. I think it's number 11 in the series. Um, this one was kind of interesting because basically... Um, there's this, this cauldron, a chaudron, uh, full of cistercias, which are the coins, um, and it suddenly goes, gets emptied, and Asterix was responsible for guarding it, so he gets banned from the, the Gaul village because of that. Sorry, I'm just trying to pick off this sticker on the back of it. Um, and so him and Obelix, and Edifix, the dog, they go off to try and refill, to remplir le, le chaudron, to refill the cauldron, um, avec de l'argent, with money. And, um, yeah, it just sort of follows that, but it was an interesting concept because normally he's sort of fighting on behalf of the village. I mean, I suppose technically he still was, but he's trying to reclaim his place in the village. Um, and it, when I did my review of this, I learned a new word as well, which was, uh, fuck it, it's, it's in English as well, it's an English word as well. Um, oh, pariah, it was pariah. Uh, so it's the same in French as in English, although it's not got the H on the end. Um, yeah, I learned a lot of new vocabulary sort of while reading this as well, and my comprehension was pretty good. I gave it a strong 3.5 out of 5, did enjoy, and I'll get to the next one sort of soonish. All right, Iru, just the one book to update you on today, and that is State of Fear by Michael Crichton. This is a long old boy, about 720 pages. Um, it's very much one of his techno thrillers. This one centers around the theme of global warming. To be honest, I can't quite figure out whether he doesn't believe in global, global warming, whether he's a denier or, or what. Um, certainly a lot of his characters are, and he cites a lot of scientific stories that, uh, that they cite to try and back their point up, so I'm not really entirely sure. Um, but there's lots of people getting shot and all of that stuff, it, you know, it's a thriller. Um, what, what, what more could you ask for, really? It's like a 3.5 out of 5. I think all of his books have been 3.5 out of 5. They're just good. They're not great, but they're good enough that I've kept reading, you know? Hello, I have some books to wrap up for you. Um, I finished reading A Shot in the Dark by Lynn Truss, a Constable Twitter mystery. Not very good, to be honest. Um, it's set in Brighton, and it keeps on referencing Brighton Rock by Graham Greene. Graham Greene is one of my favourite authors, although I'm not particularly partial to Brighton Rock, it's okay. But it just did it so often, it was kind of obnoxious. I think it was also, yeah, it was supposed to be funny, but I didn't think it was particularly funny either. Um, so I gave this one a 2.5 out of 5. It also... Uh, so I was reading this as my bedtime book, and there was this much at the end of it, I thought I still had some more to go. And it turns out this is an instalment of, um, 
the next book in the series, which I probably will still get to because Lynn Truss is one of the authors. I want to try and read everything that she wrote. But I think she is better at doing non-fiction, so there's that. And then, I'm not actually sure where it is, but I read A Brief History of Nearly Everything by Bill Bryson. Um, it's a very like science-led book. It's basically the history of science. It covers everything from the Big Bang to germ theory to asteroids to this and that. A really interesting read. It's a pretty long one. It's about 680 pages of quite small print, but um, a lot of, I think about the last 130 pages were notes and a bibliography. He basically kind of read loads of books and familiarised himself with all of these super difficult scientific concepts so that then he could just rewrite it in his own words and make it accessible to the everyday reader. Um, which I th think worked really well. It's probably one of the best science books I've ever read. I gave it a strong 4 out of 5. Alright guys, just the one book to review for you today or to wrap up should I say. This is At Home by Bill Bryson. Literally the perfect follow up for um, A Brief History of Nearly Everything because this is a short history of private life. Basically, the first book was all about um, the sciences. This one is all about the stuff that we have at home, but it covers a bit of everything. I mean, what does history really consist of? Centuries of people quietly going about their daily business, sleeping, eating, having sex, endeavoring to get comfortable. And where did all these normal activities take place? At home. So uh, he discovers surprising connections to anything from the Crystal Palace to the Eiffel Tower, from scurvy to body snatching, from bed bugs to the Industrial Revolution, and just about everything else that has ever happened. And it's just, a, again, a really engaging um, history book. I mean, it's history, but with bits of science thrown in. It's just the history of people, basically. And uh, he takes us all the way through. He's, he owns this um, old rectory. We actually have this map at the beginning. Um, and he owns this old rectory in England. And he just takes us around room by room and kind of dedicates a chapter to each of the rooms. So we've got, you know, the fuse box, the drawing room, the dining room, the cellar, etc., etc. And um, I really enjoyed it. Strong four out of five. Do recommend. Check it out. All right, just the one book to wrap up for you today. And that is The Magic of Oz by L. Frank Baum. So this is the penultimate book in the original Oz series as written by Baum. It does continue after his death. I might continue reading then as well. We'll see. Um, this one was interesting because it brings back all of the usual characters. You see uh, the Gnome King, he's like the antagonist in this. Uh, and then Dorothy and those lot are trying to find the perfect birthday present for Ozma. Um, and they end up kind of meeting each other. There's lots of transmogrifications going on. There's my cat. Uh, overall, I thought it was pretty good. It's not quite as good as the best books in the series. Um, and it's kind of a dip in quality after some recent really good ones as well. But I still gave it a pretty strong 3.5 out of 5 and would recommend it. Alrighty, so just two books to wrap up for you today. And this brings us nicely to the end of the month as well. Uh, the first one is The Battle of Corin by Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson. I gave this one a 3.5 out of 5. It was okay. It was the third and final book in the Legends of Dune trilogy, which takes a look at um, the... Hi Biggie, which takes a look at um, the battle between humans and the robots, the Butlerian Jihad, uh, the fight between the humans and the thinking machines, and it was okay. The end was a bit easy, I'm not going to lie, considering like all of the trials and tribulations it took to get there, but I did really like the way the last 30 or 40 pages or so kind of set up for the Dune books, like it set up why there's this rivalry between the Harkonnens and the Atreides, like it even set up why you have, um, you know, the, the navigators who navigate um, using their chunked in spice tanks and they like navigate through space and stuff like that it just really tied up all of the loose ends so yeah it was all right and i'll be continuing with the next one which i've already already ordered and i can't remember what it is and then i read glinda of oz by l frank baum so this is the last of the wizard of oz books that l frank baum wrote the series does continue after this with other writers he basically passed away after this point my observations for this it wasn't necessarily the best oz story just in terms of storytelling, but it did probably have the best like wisdom to it. Like it's almost as though he saved the best for last because he has a lot of just stuff that's clearly aimed at like teaching kids about the way the world is basically. And I thought it was handled really nicely in this one. Um, I still only gave it like 3.5 out of 5, it was okay. And I'm thinking about continuing with the Oz books, but I need to see what Joel wants to do, whether he wants to keep buddy reading them or not. I probably will continue with the rest of the series. Um, but I guess I'll do it at a slightly more leisurely pace if I'm not buddy reading with Joel. I don't know. We'll see. 
And so that brings me up to the end of this week's reading wrap up. So as always, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Let me know in the comments which of these books you've read and uh, what you thought of them. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.